The sisterly pretense is over. Mary decides on her own potential husband, an Englishman and a Catholic, her cousin, Henry Stewart, Lord Darnley. Darnley's actually a really good bet for Mary. He's got royal blood, um, which strengthens her own um, claim to the English throne. Moreover, he represents something extremely unusual for elite women in the 16th century, and particularly queens. He's young, he's handsome, he's desirable. He is the lustiest and best proportioned tall man that I have ever seen. Mary's desire scandalizes her court. The gossip gets back to Elizabeth through her ambassador, Thomas Randolph. She is seized in love in more fervent passions than is comely for any mean personage. Some report she is bewitched. Shame is laid aside. Darnley is but a pawn, but he may well checkmate me if he is promoted. I think Elizabeth was very suspicious of Mary's motives when it came to Lord Darnley, because Darnley, too, had royal blood. In fact, he was one of the strongest claimants to the English throne. So she undoubtedly saw this as an aggressive move on Mary's part, that she was considering marriage to this man. A Catholic couple on the Scottish throne could attract the support of England's enemies, France and Spain. So Elizabeth simply puts any question of succession on hold. Elizabeth turns round and says that she will not name her successor until she decides whether she'll marry. Nothing shall be done until I shall be married. Or shall notify my determination never to marry. This is heartbreaking for Mary. She feels played. You know, all the letters, the gifts, the petitions, it feels completely wasted. It shall turn to your discredit more than my loss. I will not fail in any good offices towards you, but to rely or trust much from henceforth in you. I will not. She gets up, she goes out, she has a good cry, and then she goes to see Darnley. On July the 29th, 1565, Mary marries Darnley without Elizabeth's permission. When she went ahead, quite rightly, and married Lord Darnley, Elizabeth was incandescent with rage. Mary can't see the problem. She thinks she's upheld her side of the bargain, effectively. She's married an Englishman, as Elizabeth had wanted. So what's the problem? You can never persuade me that I have failed you, but you have failed me. I have found your proceedings of late very strange. You forget yourself marvelously. The naming of your husband, King, shall not give him any authority to do anything. Her Majesty desires her good sister to meddle no further. Mary now has both a Catholic husband and a stronger claim to the English throne. The Queen of Scots is delighted. Suddenly, Probably for the first time, Mary really has the upper hand in this relationship. Madame Massard, I understand you are offended without just cause against the king, my husband, and myself. Mary's marriage to Darnley doesn't just offend Elizabeth. The Scottish lords are horrified. Darnley, he was awful. The Protestant lords couldn't bear him. He may have had Scottish blood, he may even have Stuart blood, but to them he was this effete, bisexual, beardless Englishman. One contemporary even called him a great cock chick. And you know, this is not the kind of guy that they want telling them what to do in Scotland. He's unfaithful to Mary, you know, from very, very early on. He's a terrible drinker. You know, he's a big whiskey drinker. You know, he, be he goes into un uncontrollable rages. I know for certain that Queen Mary repents her marriage and that she hates him. She is so much altered, her wits are not what they were, her beauty another, her cheer and countenance changed, a woman more to be pitied than any I ever saw. Once he's married, that's it, he's king. He thinks that she should be a submissive wee wifely and do exactly as he tells her. 
Then comes big news. Mary is pregnant. If it's a boy, he'll strengthen the Stuart claim to the English crown. But some wonder if Darnley is the father or one of Mary's courtiers, David Rizzio. David Rizzio is an Italian musician and he's Catholic, so of course he has to be a papal spy. He's everything that the Protestant lords can't bear. He seems to have inveigled himself into Mary's intimacies, into her familiarity. Jealous of the influence the Italian has over Mary, Downley goes after him. There are practices in hand that David, with the consent of the king, shall have his throat cut within these ten days. The attack comes suddenly. Darnley and Lord Riven, a Scottish lord, came in. They tried to detach Mary from Rizzio, but she was shielding him. He hid behind her skirts. They dragged Rizzio away and they stabbed him. It was like a cell block shanking. He was stabbed 56 times, Mary recalled. With her friend lying in a pool of blood at her feet, Mary could take no more of Darnley. You have taken your last of me and your farewell. No more tears. I will think upon revenge. She despises her husband now, and this makes her into a decisive, fearsome, strong ruler, the sort of queen that Elizabeth already is, and Mary now seizes the initiative. Fearing that Darnley will try to push her off the throne, Mary writes directly to Elizabeth, asking for support. Praying you remember your honor and our nearness of blood. The word of God commands that all princes should defend the just actions of other princes, as well as their own. For once, Elizabeth shows solidarity with her sister queen. She wears her portrait around her waist and she seems genuinely sympathetic towards Mary at this time. Do you think the Queen of Scotland has been well treated? If it had been me, I would have taken her husband's dagger and stabbed him with it. What she doesn't know is that Burley had advanced notice of the Rizzio plot and didn't bother to tell his own Queen because he knew that, that, that this would bring about turmoil in Scotland and this would help to destabilise Mary. But on June the 19th, 1566, Mary Stuart does something Elizabeth will never do. She gives birth to a male heir, James. But Mary is still miserable, shackled to her husband. Unless I am quit of the king by one means or another, I can never have a good day for the rest of my life. I could wish to be dead. Elizabeth may despise Darnley, but she never sends a single soldier to defend her cousin. Instead, Mary turns to another violent man. At the moment that Mary is at her most vulnerable, somebody steps forward, and in this case, it's the Earl of Bothwell. Yes, he will, he will help Mary, he will be her protector, but he wants something back. She doesn't know that yet. Bothwell, violently malicious, beyond measure, treacherous, and dishonest as the devil. It isn't long before an explosion destroys Darnley's bedroom, as seen in illustrations from the time. Flown in the air with such vehemence that the whole lodging, walls and other, there is nothing remaining, no. Not a stone above another, but all carried away or dashed in dross to the very ground. 
Mysteriously, Darnley's half-naked body is found 60 paces from the house, strangled. Many Scots suspect that Mary and Bothwell are behind it. Killing a king is considered the worst crime in the Christian world. With public opinion turning against Mary, Elizabeth is losing patience with her cousin. She procured her husband's murder. Bothwell, the chief murderer, was protected by her. But Mary is adamant that she has nothing to do with it. I lament the tragedy of my husband's death more than any of my subjects can do. I had never knowledge, art, nor part thereof. For the love of God, madam, use such sincerity and prudence in this case that all the world may feel justified in believing you innocent of so enormous a crime, which, if you were not, would be good cause for degrading you from the rank of princes. All of Scotland cried out upon the foul murder of the king. Everybody suspected Bothable. 